Alrighty, it's time for some brass facts. Today, the Elcan Spectre DR. I'll be dividing this review up into three sections. Overview, where I cover the basis of the product. Observation, where I go over things I observed during the review process. And uh, opinion, after rendering it, what do I think? This optic is one of a kind. In, a, in many ways, one of the first LPVOs on the market. It is unique, however, in that a simple switch of the lever is required to change it from its 1x setting to its 4x setting, instead of a rotation of a ring, which is more common or dominant with other LPVOs. Considering most of the time, the user really just wants 1x or the higher end, this is a nice quality of life feature. The optic itself comes in at 23 ounces. However, this does include the built-in mount. So putting it at about roughly average or a tad on the heavy side compared to other LPVO scope weights, uh, depending on the mount. Examining the optic, you'll notice a very, very robust build, being similar in design to ACOGs, uh, being a single solid piece housing. This thing is stout and chunky. On that note, with durability being a core tenant of this optic, the windage and elevation adjustments have been moved to the outside of the optic, further ruggedizing it. That is, to zero it, you move the entire optic itself instead of moving a mechanism, spinning screws on the inside that move the optical portion instead. This increases shock resistance, durability, makes it more resistant to blunt impacts. Though dust ingress is a concern that I will cover a little bit later. Looking into it, you'll notice a kind of iconic reticle, at least for me, owing to its legacy as a machine gun with very optimistic uh, area of effect uh, ranging for uh, machine gun fire. This version is calibrated for M855 out of a 14.5 inch barrel. I'll get to the glass quality a little later on in the observation section. The illumination is controlled by this knob on the side and is fed by a single watch battery that is a CR 2032. You get two types of illuminations, uh, a single dot at roughly 1.5 MOA and a illuminated reticle. The dot is not only daylight bright, but beyond daylight bright. It is red dot bright. This is an important distinction and puts it ahead of a lot of LPVOs. Both of these illumination modes have uh, are night vision compatible, and light transmission is significant enough through this optic, allowing passive aiming with night vision. It's not always true with most optics. Battery life is around 2,500 to 3,000 hours. More on that in the observations. Field of view is about 26 degrees, putting it slightly above average. The optic comes in with a set of passable backup irons and as well as a mounting bracket for a red dot. The irons can be moved to either side here, allowing you to still use them if you put a red dot on top, like an RMR or whatever, which would obscure them, not making them co-witness. Here's a rough visual comparison of size. This glorious package can be had for a whopping 1700 bucks or more depending on where you get it. That is a hefty chunk of change. So, how did it hold up? Alright, uh, I kind of already mentioned this, but illumination. This thing is truly daylight bright and honestly more than daylight bright. A lot of days I'll turn it down one setting, even in blazing desert sunlight. So that is absolutely excellent and probably one of the biggest low-key features on this optic. The illuminated reticle is actually though quite weak, uh, not daylight bright at all. I'm assuming this is more for dusk and uh, night vision shooting, uh, both of which are visible under night vision as mentioned. And like I said, light transmission is good enough that you can actually observe things with night vision through the optic and the illumination doesn't bloom out and take over and kick on the auto gate, whatever. So uh, I didn't actually know this, so I was pleasantly surprised when I did some shooting under 1x. Uh, obviously in a pinch, this is an ideal versus a red dot due to parallax concerns, but it does work. All right, quality of glass is good. Talking about clarity, it's probably on par with the upper end LPVOs like uh, Razer HD, TR24, SIG, you know, those thousand, thousand plus dollar LPVOs. So very similar to those on par with something like an ACOG. Uh, granted, it's worth noting the Elcan is significantly more expensive than these aforementioned ones. And compared to an optic in the $2,000 price bracket, like let's just say an attacker or something, um, it is noticeably, it noticeably falls short 
but the difference from what I could see is quite minimal, right? The difference between a, a quality $1,000 optic like the HD and a super high-end optic, it's noticeable, but it's very subtle. While the difference between a $500 optic and a $1,000 optic is quite noticeable, right? It's $1,000 seems to be the sweet spot for glass quality per money spent. So I'd say the Alcon falls directly in the sweet spot right here. In short, glass is good, great even, but not as good as it could possibly be. For distortions and aberration, uh, like issues on along the edges as well as like weird effects, uh, I'd say it's actually better than the aforementioned optics. It's clear throughout, the, that is from edge to edge, the image clarity is crisp and clean. One X is actually also excellent, probably the best part of the glass on this uh, optic. When you have both eyes open, looking through it, it's almost like you're looking through just a sheet of glass. There is no optical discrepancy. What do I mean by this? Your aided eye versus your unaided eye have a very similar image, so it kind of blends seamlessly and it feels a lot more natural. Versus even some of the nicer optics um, in this price range, which have excellent glass quality, um, no aberrations, whatever, but the 1X is ever so slightly not 1X, so you get a slight size difference between what your unaided eye sees and your aided eye sees, and you don't get that perfect seamless transition, which you experience on the LCAN. Is this relevant at all? Yes, no, it's kind of nice, but um, and it's generally not noticeable when you're shooting, but it is a thing, so plus one for LCAN here. Unfortunately, there are some downsides with the LCAN. The housing is quite large. You don't really notice it when you're shooting, but when you're looking through it, you'll notice there's quite thick walls on the side, uh, and you don't have that nice, very thin-walled effect you get with some of the other LPVOs, that seamless 1X experience. Uh, you kind of have to see through it to really understand, but if you've used an LPVO, you probably understand what I mean. The Elcanton is also, for whatever reason, tinted yellow. From what I understand, it's a European thing, uh, where they generally prefer warmer optics, uh, but I don't know, this is Canadian, so who knows. Um, but it, yeah, it does have a yellow warm hue. Uh, it's not ski goggle bright, but it is noticeable. Does it affect me while shooting? No. Does it create for any issues with looking through it? Not really. But it is a color mismatch between your dominant eye and your uh, unaided eye. So it is a thing. But it's quite subtle. Battery life is awesome. Paperwork says 600 minimum, maximum 3,000. That being said, I have left the optic on for 24 hours, seven days a week since I bought it. Conveniently, I received it on October 1st and have left it on since then. It is December 31st when I write this video. The optic is still on and kicking at one setting below the highest. That is roughly 2,100 hours, or also more than an EOTech. So unlike most LPVOs, you can actually just turn this thing on and forget about it even on a usable setting. Or if you manage it off and on, which is easy to do because there's off settings between each individual power setting, you can stretch this battery out over months and probably even years. Uh, the iron sights on top are cute. <laughs> they work, but uh, it's not something I generally use. Um, the three times I used it, I was able to easily hit a six inch plate at 30 yards, no problem. It's worth noting that because the iron sights is attached to the housing, and the housing is what gets zeroed, not the optic on the inside, um, the irons are actually zeroed. So they're effective, just, you know, they're very obviously backups. At 1x, this thing, as mentioned with the glass clarity, works great. I love the very bright red dot setting, and it makes e shooting very similar to a red dot. When stretching it out at its 4x setting, it did pretty well. I did shoot it out of an 11.5 inch barrel, so my capabilities were somewhat limited in terms of more extreme range, uh, but it worked. Turning off the illumination of the center dot uh, gives you a slightly smaller dot at a basically about the right size. Though when uh, aiming out farther, when using the subtensions, they are a bit thick and they generally obscure the target. That being said, I was shooting at 6 inch plates at 350 yards, so eh, it's kind of understandable to a degree. Um, using my using a 100 yard zero and kind of just gut feeling it to note this is configured for m855 out of a 14.5 inch barrel so with an 11.5 inch barrel the bdc subtensions don't do anything other than being used as reference marks which they actually did quite effectively i was able to get mostly first round hits out to about 325 ish at which point i find the 11.5 inch barrel has uh the bullets basically just fall from the sky at that point and i didn't really bother shooting any further 
The best way to explain the reticle is the dot is awesome at 1x, and for 4x, the reticle is good enough not to fight you or cause friction, but not good enough to actually make the job easier, if that makes sense, compared to other optics. Eye relief is not terrible. You're looking at about a standard 2.7 inches. Uh, a little close, but nothing as far back like the Razer HD, where I swear you could hold the thing like a literal pistol and still be in that eye box. It's massive. As for the forward and back leniency, it's pretty tight, so head back or head forward. Uh, if you're not comfortable with it, you'll find yourself kind of um, seeing scope shadow quite frequently. Uh, but if you are used to it, you're all, you'll find yourself in the sweet spot quite often. So it's not great, but it's passable. Side to side for the eye box is unfortunately worse than average. Uh, if you move your head left or right, you'll quickly not be able to see anything as the whole thing blacks out. Uh, it's a bummer, but it is what it is. Two things I'll comment on, which is a little less observations and more just deal, uh, talking about certain aspects. First off, a lot of complaints come from the arms lever. Um, they're considered not great uh, mounting options. And specifically in this case, these ones are not adjustable. That is, you can't tighten them or loosen them. So if you come out with, a, with your receivers worn in or out of spec, you'll find yourself, you might not get the snug requirement you required. I personally didn't have any issues, and I don't know of any of them that have, but it is a thing. You can buy aftermarket uh, to, like enhanced arms levers, which are adjustable. I didn't feel the need to do this, though. Next up, exposed zeroing. So, as mentioned, the zeroing is moved on the outside to make the optic itself uh, less likely to lose zero when an internal mechanism slips or fails, which is why this is incredibly durable. However, there are some downsides. This thing, even though it's robust, the outside zeroing mechanisms can have dust ingress on them, specifically the elevation. Uh, reports from theater usage claim that, uh, have some people claiming that this thing loves to eat dust, it gets in there, starts grinding up, and then the mechanism begins to fail over time. So far, in my very short testing, about three months, 1,500 rounds, uh, out in the desert, covered in dust, and then later snow and mud, I've had zero issues. And while this has killed lesser firearms, I'll keep you up to date on how the LCAM functions over the course of my usage with it. And yes, I'll keep it and kind of keep you up to date if there's any changes. Okay, in conclusion, what are my thoughts? A couple disclaimers first. This optic is more than a decade old, so obviously it will start to show its age. Uh, but I still have to ding it as if it's a brand new optic. After all, you're going to buy this or you're going to buy something else that's new. So you got to compare it to the competition. Second disclaimer, I bought this on like 50% cool factor. This thing is awesome. Uh, it's just like the ACOG. It's got that legacy pedigree. Uh, seeing these guys on Mark 18s out in the G-Watt uh, has seared this in my mind as a badass optic for badass dudes. So naturally, I've always wanted one because obviously... This makes me a badass as well, right? <laughs> All right, anyway, here goes. If we look at the glass construction and clarity, I'd say this is worth roughly $900, maybe more because it's got that really nice true 1X. Add in the extreme ruggedness, maybe we're pushing $1,100, $1,300. The quick, uh, quick lever mechanism, which is significantly easier to use over a standard LPVO, maybe you get to $1,500. However, it's 4X instead of 6X, which is a pretty big hit when you compare it to other optics on the market, maybe down to 13, give or take. That's uh, pretty far off from the $17 to $2,000 you're going to be spending on this thing. That kind of sums it up. As a generic optic to recommend to someone with cash to burn, it's kind of hard to recommend. It's got a restrictive reticle with a BDC instead of a more modern, versatile reticle. It's got less magnification versus cheaper options. The 1X is actually really nice, but it's let down by a large housing and a unneeded tint. It's really hard to recommend this, especially at its price point, to anyone that doesn't seek it out personally. Even the Steiner 4X, uh, PX4i uh, seems to be better value at like one third the cost. <laughs> then why the hell do I still own this thing? Uh, the cool factor has worn off. Okay, it's, it's still kind of there a little bit. Because I think the combination of features is worth more than the sum of the parts kind of thing. Do I think a regular LPVO in the $700 to $1,300 price range is generically generally better? 
Yes, of course, because usually they also even come with a 6X and they do a lot of what this does. But the combination of a near true 1X, the very red, uh, bright red dot, which makes the 1X setting very good, the insanely rugged design, and the easy quick throw lever, uh, and its compact size, well, at least compact lengthwise, uh, gets me an optic that I find fits my objectives for this specific rifle. Since this rifle is generally going to be on the 1x, 95 plus percent of the time, uh, the 4x is good enough and a lot more bearable. Would 6x be nice? Yeah, of course. But the lack of a 6x is a lot less painful on a setup like this. Without being too cringy, this is a good end of the world setup, or optic. It's sort of a what if ACOG had 1x, for the lack of a better term. So, if you think the above matches your need, this might be the optic for you. Especially if this also gives you the warm and fuzzies. However, if you're dead nuts set on being a practical person and maximizing your money spent, this is probably not where you want to start. Especially if you want to sacrifice a tiny bit of tank proofness for maybe something like APC proof. <laughs> the features on modern LPVOs um, kind of outpace this at this point, uh, especially at a lower price point, and they make a lot more sense in that regard, especially since most of them are still quite durable. Okay, I hope this long ramble made sense to you. I'll tie it up here and uh, leave it for you to decide. This has been some brass facts for you. Make sure you comment on your, your thoughts in the comment section. Uh, let me know what you think. Sub if you're interested in this kind of thing. There'll obviously be more videos, and uh, I'll see you around.